Hi, I am Tom Christensen of Neurocrawl. In this video, I will be taking a look at the performance of these power supplies when they power this Neurochrome Universal Buffer. The Universal Buffer is an extremely high-end audio circuit. It provides a vanishingly low distortion, extremely low noise, but it does require a power supply. And it is also a great example of a preamp. So if you're looking to set up a lab where you want to measure some audio circuits or design audio circuits, perhaps in your small business or at home, you will likely be looking at buying a power supply. And it's tempted to grab a pair of these Hanmatic uh, HM310s because they are incredibly cheap. They are available for about 80 bucks a piece and they provide 310 watts. But I kind of wonder, do you really get what you pay for? That's what I'm looking to answer in this video. So I will be comparing these two power supplies against this old workhorse, the HP 6237B. The 6237B started rolling off the assembly line somewhere in the mid to late 1970s. And it is a rock solid power supply. It is available online for somewhere around $150 and up for one in good condition. If you would rather not have these moving coil meters, but you prefer the digital readout, the modern equivalent is the HP or Agilent or Keysight E3620A. And that is available new for about $1,200 or on the used market for around the $200 $250 mark. This is the Hanmatech HM310. It provides 0 to 30 volts at 0 to 10 amps, so a total of 300 watts on the main output. And then it has a secondary output here that's a USB type A, and that provides 5 volts at 2 amps. One thing that's really striking about this is its size. It's basically the size of, you know, a couple of textbooks. And it is super light. It weighs one and a half kilos. So this is clearly a switching power supply. Let's tear into it. So this is what it looks like on the inside. There are some no-name Chinese capacitors, a current shunt probably for monitoring the output current, some transformers. Interestingly, one of them has this funky flyby lead here. Um, that's kind of curious. I'm guessing they did that to meet creepage or insulation uh, standards. I'm guessing it's a resonant design based on this polypropylene capacitor here. Also note that there's a separate supply for the USB. That's probably just the off-the-shelf part that they uh, bought and stuck in there. The circuit board is, I mean, the assembly quality is kind of okay-ish. There's hot glue in a couple of places, but it's not fantastic, I would say. But it's about, I mean, for 80 bucks, that's about what I would expect. The biggest concern I have is this attempt at making a heat sink here. It's basically a stamped piece of aluminum that has the power devices mounted to it. There is a thermistor back here that keeps an eye on the temperature. And it's fan cooled with this uh, fan back here, but I highly doubt that this is going to be very efficient. And if this power supply is supposed to be, be able to deliver 300 watts, then I would expect somewhere around 45 watts to be the dissipated in these devices. And I doubt that'll make it, but I guess we'll find out. I'll torture test it later. Now flipping it over to the back side, we can see that the company didn't really want to spend on... Uh, thicker copper so instead what they did was they made openings in the solder mask so that when the board went through wave soldering it picked up a bunch of solder but I mean it's way thicker here and here than it is here for example so I mean they didn't do a fantastic job with this it's also coated in flux down here it's probably no clean flux but uh, I mean this doesn't exactly scream quality but on the other hand $80 doesn't exactly scream quality either. Maybe you get free what you pay for, maybe you get more. We'll find out. And up against the front panel there is a uh, circuit board that has some, it looks like a switching power supply and also a microcontroller and some other chips on it. On the front panel here we have you know, a pair of encoders. They actually feel pretty good. 
They do have a switch but that barely has any travel, but it, it is there. The output jacks are pretty small, and I'm kind of curious if they will actually survive the full 10 amp output current. And then there's a, a push button power switch. On the back side of this thing uh, is the IAC inlet, uh, fan exhaust, and then a uh, power switch. The standard spacing for binding posts on test equipment is three quarters of an inch or 19.05 millimeters. Unfortunately, Hanmatech had to be different. The binding posts are a little bit further than three quarters of an inch apart, and that means you cannot use a standard banana plug adapter. To set the output voltage, you push the encoder and you then get to change the output voltage 10 millivolts at a time. Unfortunately, the encoder doesn't really have any sort of acceleration on it, and it's actually fairly slowly responding. So you kind of have to be slow and deliberate when you adjust it. And thankfully, you can actually push multiple times and you get to select which digit that you want to change. So now we're cooking with gas like that. And similar for the current, if you push the uh, current encoder, then you get to change the current one milliamp at a time and you can select which digit you want to change. It's a bit unfortunate that the um, supply times out so quickly. This is the HP 6237B. It is a triple output power supply. And output number one provides 0 to 18 volts at up to 1 amp. Outputs 2 and 3 form a bipolar supply that can provide 0 to plus minus 20 volts at up to 500 milliamps. The closest modern equivalent to the HP 6237B is the HP E 3620A. That is a dual output power supply. So it has two fully independent uh, power supplies that can be adjusted independently as well. And each of them provides 0 to 25 volts at up to 1 amp. Another variant of the HP 6237B is the 6236B. That is also a triple output power supply, but output number one on the 6236B provides 0 to 6 volts at 2.5 amps. Outputs 2 and 3 are identical to the outputs on the 6237B, so 0 to plus minus 20 volts at up to 500 milliamps. And for the 6236B, there is a modern day equivalent, and that would be the Keysight E3630A. I'm sorry, I don't mean to drown you in model numbers here. It's just that it's handy to have a couple of options to look for when you're out on the used market. And just one note, I will not be including this in the review because even though it is a more modern version of this, it basically provides the same performance. It has the same specs. So I am not going to spend your time um, reviewing this. But now let's take a peek inside the HP 6237B. As we can see, this is almost a completely discrete design. There are a couple of op amps here. Uh, but mostly it's diodes and resistors and so on. And we have the pass devices back here mounted on the sizable heatsink. There's some trim pots in here that I used for uh, calibration. If I interpret the date codes on the components correctly, this particular supply was built in 1984. Turning the supply over, we notice that there's a little bit of flux residue here and also here on the power transformer. And similarly on some of the output devices. I'm thinking that's original flux and not left over from a repair. And also I'm guessing based on the color here that it's probably RMA flux. You know, one could be tempted to remove it, but honestly, it's been there for what, 40 years now. So I think I'll just leave it alone. The user interface on the 6237B is about as simple as it gets. This switch here selects which of the three outputs that these two meters measure. So this meter indicates the output voltage and this the output current. And I have output number one selected, so I can adjust the output voltage with this potentiometer here. And if I select the second output, I can adjust the output voltage here. And for the third output, that normally tracks 
the second output. If I don't want them to track, I turn this knob here, and now I can independently vary the output voltage of the third output. I normally leave it in tracking, so that's fully clockwise. Even for something this simple, it is remarkable that HP has managed to work in one usability snag. And that is that this terminal here, the common terminal, is colored red. Normally, on a modern supply, this terminal is black and all the other outputs are red. Then the frame ground would be green. The frame ground is actually not referenced to any of these. So if you try to connect from here to there and expecting to get somewhere between 0 and 20 volts, you will be quite disappointed. So make sure you connect your load from common to plus 18 or from common to plus minus 20. One thing that's a bit annoying about the HP 6237B is that the terminals are really close to the bottom. So it can be a bit annoying to get your hands in and turn the binding posts. But a pair of regulation size hockey pucks will fix that. Simply slide them under and now you got all the space in the world. I have the Henmatech dialed in for 15 volts and set the current limit for 550 milliamps. Similarly, I have the HP dialed in for 15 volts and it has a built-in non-programmable current limiter of 550 milliamps as well. I will load these with a uh, BK Precision 8600B electronic load. I have the load set to draw 500 milliamps. And now let's measure the load regulation of these power supplies. To prevent the contact resistance of these banana plugs from interfering with the measurement, I will be measuring directly at the output terminals with these probe leads. So now let's look at the output of the Hamatech power supply. And this is with the load turned off. We can see it provides 15.01 volts. And now let's turn the load on. And it looks like the output voltage dropped by about two and a half millivolts. In fact, let's let the meter do the math for us by hitting the null button. So now it measures the difference between the load off and the load on. And we see the Hanmatech drops by two and a half millivolts. That's pretty good. Now let's repeat for the HP power supply. And as we can see, by coincidence, I also have the HP dialed in for 15.01 volts. And now let's turn the load on. Wow. So I think it dropped by 200 microvolts. Maybe 300. Let's let the meter do the math here. So this is with the load off and load on. So 300 microvolt, 400 microvolt. That's impressive. And let's, for completeness, test the minus 20 volt output of the HP as well. This also gives us an idea of what the tracking accuracy is. Because you remember the plus 15 measured 15.01 volts, and the minus 15 measures minus 14.996. So they, the two outputs track within 10 millivolts. That's pretty decent. Now let's turn the load on. And it looks like it barely dropped. Maybe the same two, 300 microvolts. Let's let the meter do the math for us. Yeah, 200 microvolts. That is impressive. Cool. Delivering power to a static load is fairly easy for a power supply. But delivering power to a dynamic load, i.e. one that changes over time, is quite another matter. And a dynamic load could be something like a light bulb that turns on and off, a relay that turns on and off, or digital logic that's switching, or class AB audio circuits. And that's where it becomes relevant for me especially. So I have this BK Precision 8600B electronic load configured to provide a square wave load function. So it draws zero current for half the cycle, then jumps up to 450 milliamps for the other half of the cycle. And it repeats that pattern at a rate of one kilohertz. Let's look at the output voltage of the Henmatech power supply 
with this kind of a load. Looking at the oscilloscope here, we have the load current indicated on the green trace, and that is actually taken from the current monitor output of the electronic load. The yellow trace is the output voltage of the power supply. It is AC coupled, which is why it's centered around ground here. And you'll notice that when the load drops to zero amps, then the power supply voltage jumps up by maybe 50 or so millivolts, and then it wiggles a little bit and settles. When the load current jumps up, the power supply voltage drops by about 50 millivolts and rings a little bit until it settles. The other thing we notice here is that it's not a fantastic clock source in this electronic load. That's why the waveform is so jittery. Now let's take a look at the output of the HP power supply with this kind of a load. As we see here, the output of the HP power supply reacts a lot faster. Basically, you get this pop when the load drops and you get a similar notch in the voltage when the load increases. And then the output settles quickly to the nominal load voltage. And this pop is supposed to not be longer than uh, 20 microseconds. So let's take a look at that. Let's freeze the frame here. I have 10 microseconds per division here. So let's just see how far that pop, it's actually settled within 20 microseconds. And that certainly wasn't the case for the Hanmatech supply. And now for the real world test. This is the Neurochrome Universal Buffer and I have it powered by these Hanmatech HM310. The Neurochrome Universal Buffer is a super high end audio preamp building block. It can be used to convert from balanced to unbalanced and vice versa. It can also be used as a buffer from balanced to balanced and like you see here from unbalanced to unbalanced. As we can see in the audio precision software, I have the analyzer configured such that the output of the buffer is at two volts. That is a very common consumer level output. What I also notice is that the distortion is quite a bit higher than I had expected. I had expected at least one if not two zeros here, so something is going on. And recall when I say distortion, what I mean is THD plus N, so plus noise. And this mains hum that we see here is included in that plus N. Also, I notice a whole forest of harmonics here. We can take a closer look in a little bit. And that's a bit out of the ordinary. So let's run a distortion sweep. And as we can see here in the distortion sweep, the distortion or THD plus N is actually quite high, even across frequency. And that's definitely not to spec. So I need to figure out what's going on here. And uh, once the sweep finishes, I will take a quick look at the harmonic spectrum at the output of the buffer. And as we see here in the harmonic spectrum of the output of the buffer, there's quite a bit of mains hum. And this thing here also catches my eye. I am willing to bet that that is the switching frequency of these Hanmatech power supplies. There is actually a sort of a software trick that we can use to filter that out. I can set the measurement bandwidth of the audio precision to 40 kilohertz. With the 40 kilohertz measurement bandwidth, that stuff should be knocked way down. And let's have a look if that is in fact the case. And it sure looks like it. So this is the measurement in progress, and this is the previous measurement. And we can clearly see that the switching hash has been knocked down by quite a bit. So now let's go back and look at the distortion sweep. So that's better. It's still not to spec, but at least it's quite a bit better. So what we can conclude from this is that this difference here is caused by the removal of the switching frequency and the, the associated noise. It is also caused by the reduction in noise bandwidth when we went from 80 kilohertz to 40 kilohertz. And this is curious. You can see it a little bit here as well, but that seems to have something to do with the power supply itself. So let's have another look at the FFT. We might have to do something about all that mains hum there.
And I fiddled with that for quite a bit. And what I ended up concluding was that if I take a test lead and I connect that from the frame ground of the audio precision to the center point between the two power supplies, i.e. the ground point, um, more accurately, it's a common point, then a lot of that mains hum seems to go away. So let's have a look at the harmonic spectrum. And now you see a lot of that hash has really been knocked down. And also, we can also see that a lot of this, this whole forest of grass here, has been reduced to basically the harmonic distortion of the buffer. That is likely because all that mains hum intermodulated with the carrier and created a whole bunch of IMD products that you see in this forest here. So now let's look at the distortion sweep. So now it's starting to look promising. I was still expecting a bit better performance than this, but this is really not bad. It's just, uh, it's a smidge higher than I would have expected. But uh, once this, the sweep finishes, I'll switch over to the HP power supply so we can compare. Now let's have a look at the performance of the universal buffer when it's powered by the HP 6237B power supply. Just as we did with the first measurement with the Hanman Tech, I have set the software of the audio precision to 80 kilohertz measurement bandwidth. And I have also set the software such that we have two volts on the output. And we immediately notice that the distortion is a lot lower and also all that mains hum is gone. And so is the forest of harmonics here. So that's perfect. Let's have a look at the distortion sweep. So this is looking pretty good. And I had expected it to be a little bit lower, but this is fine. The reason that I have that expectation might be because I usually uh, use a differential input with the universal buffer. And in this case, I decided let's try for a single ended input instead because that's a more common use case. And the distortion might be a little bit higher with that uh, type of input. But this is looking pretty good. And if we have a look at, at the FFT, we'll notice that there's a little bit of stuff going on down here. This could actually be uh, Wi-Fi starting to creep in. And this is a bit of a mains hum. And this could be, this is the third harmonic of the mains frequency. That's the fifth harmonic. So this might be a little bit of residual ripple. And that's uh, from the power supply. And then we have basically the harmonics at the output of the buffer. And that's it. And that's cool. Let's have a look at the distortion sweep with 40 kilohertz measurement bandwidth. And as you can see, this measurement is a lot better than the Hanmatek, which is this tr uh, these traces here. So this difference here is due to all the mains hum that snuck through the Hanmatek power supply. As we also noticed, I could connect that test lead and make the measurement results even better. And that would be the case uh, shown here, where the Hanmatech with that grounding trick and the HP without any special tricks are basically line on line. So as we can see, it is possible to get good performance with these Hanmatek power supplies. You just have to be really careful and you might have to resort to some special tricks. Unlike the HP power supply, which just provides good performance. Hey, what a novel idea. Um, I'm not personally a fan of having to resort to special tricks and remember to connect this magic wire from point A to point B. Um, so, because I've spent a lot of time chasing down weird cable issues and that sort of thing. So I would much rather go with a power supply that just works, but the choice is yours. I do have another video that I suggest that you check out that shows the performance of these when they're powering a uh, power amplifier and they don't fare as well in that video. So eh, the choice is yours.
And now for the fun part of the show. At least, I hope we get to blow this up. Um, that's my plan. I am just trying to hold the manufacturer to the specs that they uh, promised when I bought it. And one of those specs was that it can deliver 10 amps of output current. And I kind of wonder how hot these uh, output terminals get after a while of 10 amps. So that's the experiment I have set up here. The load will draw 10 amps and the power supply will provide one volt with a 10.1 amp current limit. So, without further ado, let me turn the output on. Like that. And you might notice that the reading on the display here is quite a bit different from the reading of the display here. And that's the drop across the wires. And also the banana plugs. Like I mentioned, they're not exactly fantastic connectors. But let's see. Well, anyway, we had about a foot of snow dumped on us last night. So, I'll go shovel that and I'll come back in a bit. So it's been about 20 minutes now. The power supply is still going and it's still delivering uh, one volt at 10 amps. And it seems to be running just fine. The fan has turned on, as you can hear. Every once in a while, it'll cycle off and then come back after a few seconds later. And that's probably just the temperature sensor inside saying, hey, it's getting kind of cold now. Um, so that's fine. And it also turns out that the binding posts are holding up just fine. I mean, they're not even warm to the touch. And if I measure their temperature with this IR thermometer, it comes in at about 27 degrees and it's still ticking up a little bit, but I had expected a lot worse. So I think I withdraw my uh, concern about the binding posts. My concern about whether this power supply can actually deliver 300 watts still stands, however. So let's check that out. For this part of the torture test, I have the output of the Hanmatech connected to my speaker dummy load. So that is a 4 ohm resistor that can handle 500 watts. Unfortunately, it's also fan cooled, so there will be a little bit more noise in here, but such is life. That 4 ohm resistor uh, will draw about 7.5 amps from the power supply, and I need to draw a total of 10. So to pick up the slack, I have the electronic load configured such that the total load on the power supply is 300 watts. Let's power this puppy on and see how this goes. So that was the first part, and there you go, 300 watts. And I should probably turn the fan on on those load resistors. So this might be one of those occasions where I get to eat my words. Because I thought I was going to blow this up. And so far that hasn't happened. This supply has been delivering 300 watts for over 3 hours continuously now. It's done a wonderful job of heating up my lab. But it hasn't failed yet. And that's a good thing. That also means that the quality of these cheap supplies is getting a lot better. Because I bought one about 10 years ago and that was pretty crappy. I mean, it wasn't the same brand, but same overall concept. So now after three hours, I mean, it is getting a bit lukewarm to, to the touch. And also the um, binding posts are getting a little warm. So if we look at the temperature of the binding posts, we'll find that it's now in the low 30s. And I mean, that's comfortable. And also, if we look at the exhaust air, we are finding temperatures sort of in the low to mid 30s. So, I mean, clearly it doesn't seem to be overheating. So overall, I would say that this power supply provides pretty decent performance. It's not great, but you also don't pay a lot. If you can live with the sort of quirky user interface that times out on you when you're trying to change the voltage, and you can live with the ground current that this seems to send through your audio circuits, then this might be a good option for you. So there you have it. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, click like. And also, if you have suggestions on how I can improve these videos, drop them in the comments down below. I do read the comments, but I might take a while to respond. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.